Okay, so we're talking about uh, blending fundamentals of music theory. Uh, I'm Chris White, that's Luke Phelan. Um, I teach at UMass, and uh, Luke works at something that we might call a consortium. Um, so today I'm going to give you an overview first of the goals in our course description. Uh, I'll start a mock lesson that I would use these uh, the tools that I'm going to present in. Uh, we'll begin in a lecture format, then I'm going to turn to the blended materials that I'll present, and then we'll turn to through some of a mock classroom discussion. And then um, we'll talk through how uh, we assess um, the, uh, the use of these tools. Um, so the goals for, uh, for blending music, uh, uh, the music theory classroom is to increase the efficiency of and provide immediate feedback to students learning basic music skills. So uh, music theory is kind of like, what is music theory is kind of like learning a language where uh, you, know, you either know what that word in German means or you don't. Uh, you either can read Cyrillic or you can't. And it's like you know what's a half note or you don't know what's a half note. You know whether that's a B or not a B. And so uh, what I want to use uh, our blended tools for is to increase the efficiency of this step, learning how to read music, learning how to know whether something's a half note or a whole note. And this will allow me to shift classroom focus towards broader cultural or social questions surrounding music theory and musical practice. So increasing the efficiency. Um, we, uh, we create online tools that allow students to practice particular skills to a point of fluency. Uh, it'll show them what they get wrong, it'll provide hints to help them troubleshoot, um, and then I'll give them online quizzes to validate this fluency, and it helps me know um, how they're doing. Uh, let me show you that. So um, this is what it looks like. The lights go. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so we'll have questions like this, where it'll say, the symbol is, and then they will have to say that it is two eight notes. And we check the answer, and immediately it would tell them, yeah, that's right. Um, but let's um, try again. Let's say that they looked at that and they said that it was a quarter note. They would say, no, that's actually two eighth notes. So the next time that they saw that question, they would um, be prompted for the correct answer. Um, we ran, and by next time, I mean the questions are all randomized. There's a bank of more questions than, uh, so let's say that this homework is 10 questions, there might be a bank of 40 questions that then uh, would be randomly generated. So when I try this again, I will get something else. So this is, and then we let's say, red rest. And so yeah, that is it. And then if we try it again, we get a new question. Um, and so uh, they would practice this over and over to start being like, okay, this is what this looks like, this is what this looks like. Um, and we have this for all sorts of different uh, topics. So for instance, homework four, if I pull up homework four, Show them that, and I would say, what kind of note is that? Oh, goodness. And I would have to put in that that's a B. Uh, I think in this one I have to say that that's a B4. And I would say, yes, you're correct. So that's the kind of things that our questions are up to. Um, and then in terms of shifting the focus towards a broader cultural or social question, um, so less time developing fluency in the classroom means more time doing higher level work. Um, I have all my homework that includes short uh, writing responses or reading prompts to initiate a deep in classroom discussion. Let me show you how this looks. So a reading prompt could be to read that article, which points you to this box piece. The music theory principle that unifies 2016's radio hits. Um, and uh, this goes through and it talks about uh, ambiguous key centers. And it talks about how that, ten that tended to happen more frequently in 2016 than it had before. So they read that and then they answer these questions. What's well, an ambiguous key cent uh, center? What's its effect on listeners? Um, I have them compare this to uh, what they had read the previous week, which was an article from the New Yorker. Um, uh, 
uh, why I asked them to then do a higher level um, analytical thing where they ask why they think that it's popular now, and then I give them a, uh, a rubric that, the, that they'll be greater on for, the, for this month. And then I use their answers to start a classroom discussion about this uh, on the following week. So we've got these two kinds of goals where we take something that we used to do and we're trying to do it better, and doing that better is going to open up um, space for doing new things that we didn't do before, that is these kind of high-level um, discussions. Um, how we quantify these learning outcomes? Well, I'm going to ask whether grades are higher this semester than before, um, then doing this new thing opening the fact for more uh, musical sophistication. <clears throat> I want to ask whether musical sophistication increases from the beginning to the end of class. And um, we'll talk about how we quantify that after I run through the, uh, the mock lesson. But spoiler, it has to do with the, those questions that you asked. And so, mm -hmm. so um, course details for this course, I've got 80 students in this class. It's a big class to do, to do something like this in. There's no prerequisite. <clears throat> Um, it is not within the music major sequence. Music majors take a different introduction to music theory course. This is for non-majors. <clears throat> it's the only such course within the five college consortium, so the 38,000 students that are within the five colleges, this is the only such course that, that does this. Um, it provides a quantitative general education requirement for UMass students. UMass students have to do something like Introduction to Psychology, Stats 101, Introduction to Computer Programming, that, that takes some kind of formal system, they have to learn a formal system, and then use it, manipulate it, wrap their minds around it, and music theory uh, checks that box for them. So they can take Introduction to Computer Programming, or they can take Music Theory. Um, mm -hmm. So I get, uh, yeah. So um, let me show you how, uh, an, classroom would, uh, or lesson would look and how the, um, these online tools work into, um, work into these lessons. So I'm going to show you this lesson. It's going to point you toward internet-facing tools, and then we'll come back together for a discussion um, after uh, you can use these different uh, tools. For it. And then we'll close out the same assessment. So um, we're going to pretend like I'm um, introducing staff notation to you for a second. Are, are you all musicians? Yes, Great. Okay. So, so it's exactly like like my class. Like some students yeah. read, come and read music, some students don't come and read music. Right. So this is great. Right. Um, so staff notation is writing note heads on a series of lines and spaces. Um, each move between a line to its adjacent space or moving from a space to its adjacent line is a step, or we can call it a second. So if you see something like like this, you've got some lines and you've got some spaces, and you're going from a line to the space right next to it, it's a second. It's a step. You go from this note to the note that's right next to it. So you go right to the note right next to it. But if you went from the line and you skipped that space, but you went to the next line, you wouldn't go bum, bum. You'd go bum, bum. So bum, bum. You'd get between here and there because you skip one of the sort of ticks in this ladder that is being represented <coughs> by the lines and the spaces here. But then you go even larger. Um, jumps. So instead of going bum bum or even bum bum bum, you go bum 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 bum. bum. So this would be bum bum because you're skipping uh, from the first step of our letter to the sixth step of the letter. So this is the intuition behind staff notation: is that it's like a ladder that you're moving these little bumps up and down on. And then we use clefs to show exactly what pitch corresponds to each line in space. So a clef shows us where a particular letter name appears on a staff. So it say something like, this line is an F, or this line is a C. And once you know where one letter is, you can extrapolate to the remainder of the staff. So uh, this is an early example of this, a historical example of this, where some monk comes in, writes five lines, and says, this line's a C, this line's an F. And so you can figure out that if you go one letter back, so uh, if you are just thinking in terms of the alphabet, one letter backwards from C is B, one letter backwards from B is A, one letter forward from A is B. And so if you go from this line to this space, you go from A to B. If you 
skip one, you can go from A to C. And this little cleft sign says that this is C. And this line says that this is F. And that makes sense because going C, B, A, G, F to enter that step will get you to an F. Um, so uh, from this sort of historical beginnings, um, you get clefts that show you where C is, where F is, where G is. Uh, the most prominent ones that we end up with today are ones that show you where F and G are. This is what they looked like way at the beginning. If we're talking about 12th century, this is how the monks would write them. And they eventually um, evolve. So we get more fanciful kinds of Gs. And then we get this, which is what you would see today if you opened up a score. Similarly here, you get people writing more fanciful kinds of Fs. Uh, this isn't even a fanciful kind of F. It's just like a thing that used to have been an F. And then we get this, um, which is what you would, if you opened up a score, you'd see today. Um, in principle, you can put these anywhere you want. You can say, this line's an F, this line's an F, this line's an F, or this line's a G, this line's a G, but it becomes very standardized after the 1700s. And so you get the G clef on the second line, the F clef on the fourth line there, and we call the, that G clef the treble clef, and that F clef the bass clef. Um, we can remember what the letters are using mnemonics. Which if you took piano when you were in first grade or something like that, you remember that the spaces on the treble clef staff spell out F A C E, and the spaces on the bass clef are A G, or all cars eat gas, uh, good burritos don't fall apart are the lines, every good boy does fine, but golly gosh, there are lots of different mnemonics that you can use. All cows eat grass, good boys do fine, always elephants get big, dirty feet, whatever. <laughs> um, if we were in my classroom, I would say, uh, everybody please now look down at the handout. Um, I would like you to uh, choose one of these mnemonics that you like the best and write it down. Um, this is the second thing down in your handout, and then use that to fill in the top thing in your handout, notating where each of the, uh, what the, um, Letters that correspond to each of the lines on that snap are. Um, we don't have to do that now. You can if you'd like. But that's what we would do if we were um, in my classroom. We would push ahead then, um, after doing perhaps some <coughs> more little drilling activities to make sure everybody was on board, <coughs> to say that you can go above and below the staff by adding ledger lines. So if you are up here, Every good boy does fine, this is an F, but if you wanted to go above it, you would hang a note above the staff and you get a G. And if you wanted to go even above that, you put a new line and you put a note on it. And that would get you A, because A is right after G, and so on. Good boys do fine always, or good burritos don't fall apart. So that's the top line. You wanted to go higher than it, you'd hang a note above it and it would be a B. Similarly, you could add a ledger line and you'd get a C right above that. And finally, triple and bass clefs actually capture pitches in different octaves. Um, so if we are talking about this D here, we're talking about a D that sounds about here. But if we're talking about this D down here, we're talking about a D that sounds down here. So there are different Ds that we're talking about. How do we distinguish between these? Well, we use number <coughs> designations. And that's the third thing on your handout, that if we're talking about a C, which is really low, we'd be talking about C2. If we talk about the C that's an octave above that about here, um, we'd be talking about C3. And those are the Cs that are available on the bass clef. If we went into the treble clef, and we were talking about a C that's around here, we'd be um, talking about C4. And even higher than that would be C5, and so on. Um, you have an example with all of the C's on your handout. So um, using <coughs> everything that you're looking at in front of you, so at this point in the lesson, you know, the students would have all of the tools that they're looking at on their handout in front of them. I'd say, hey, what's this? And they would say, all right, it's a D. And then I'd say, what D is it? It would be D4. 
And so that's so I make sure that everybody had the basic tools in, uh, available to them to do this, and then we would turn to the internet um, and do some drilling tools. Now, um, I want to put that all into into one time box for this presentation. So let's pretend like we just did that, and then let's. Uh, but let me talk about one thing first. Let's consider where this all came from. Because before the 12th century, most pitch notation in Western Europe were these squiggles that just showed the basic contour of the melody. Um, so this is a little example down there. We call it in campo aperto, or in open field notation. This is a bigger example of that. So just to show like where the melody is, you get these ah, 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 ah. Um, contours. Here's another example of that, where it's alleluia, just to show, and it shows the, rel the relative contour there. <coughs> um, but the monks were avid readers and are aware of this old, old, old Greek practice of naming pitches by letters, and so uh, they think, okay, well, what's uh, above, let's call something an A, and then if we want something above the A, we'll call it a B, and if we want something above that, we'll call it a C, and so on. And so you get these uh, monks that then notate exactly how far away their squiggles are by annotating some letters underneath. So, ale is notated that that's exactly that far away, because D is one further than C. And so some monk came underneath uh, those squiggles and wrote exactly how far away he meant those squiggles to be. Well, there's two problems. Of course, it's imprecise and it's hard to read. Um, so some monks started writing a reference line. You get this red line that says, okay, everything, when we come back to this line, we're coming back to the same pitch. But then this guy, Guido Varezzo, basically invents modern um, notation in the early 11th century. He invents staff notation and the practice of using clefs. This takes off, and by the 12th century, almost everybody is using this type of music notation. And it looks like this. And this is what, where, where we ended up at. This is a C, that's an F. And so that's saying that this F then goes down to a D, then comes back to an F, then goes up to a G, and so on. And so we've got our modern staff notation now. As everything that we learned about in this class, or we would have learned about this class at this point in the semester, staff notation arises from medieval monks trying to solve some problem. And your discussion questions ask you to think about the problems that staff notation was trying to solve. So on your handouts, I've got a couple of discussion questions. Please think of two reasons why early Middle Ages, like early medieval Western European cultures, did not need precise musical notation. So I'd ask my students, I'd say something like, um, you probably all know different uh, different levels of, uh, of, of different levels of precision stuff about the early Middle Ages, but like think this is like King Arthur time. Why would um, they not necessarily need precise musical notation? And then what problem was that notation trying to solve? And what sorts of societal or cultural changes might have been happening around the 11th and 12th century to make staff notation so immediately popular. Something was happening before the 11th and 12th centuries to make it not catch on, and then something happened in the 11th and 12th centuries to make it catch on. Um, and then this is a more sophisticated question that's also on your handout. Uh, in American culture, the percent of the population who can read music peaked in the early 20th century and has been declining ever since. Why do you think it is? Is it because there are aspects of our culture that are similar to the early Middle Ages? Is it because things like this are coming back? Or is it because we are developing some new or novel societal characteristics? In other words, does this trend arise from society regressing or progressing? Or is it? Okay, so um, I would, uh, if, if y'all can uh, use your devices for, for playing around with, with these tools, uh, we could, um, uh, you could look at homework four, which is supposed to drill exactly what we just uh, what we just talked about. And so you can put yourself in my students' shoes and work on homework four if you like.
Um, and you can also cruise the other homeworks. Um, and it would be fun for you to think about the discussion questions that I threw out there. And I would say do whatever you like at this point. Yeah. Yeah, we can sort of float around and um, open it up. Um, and I think Chris said, but also on the back of this um, one, there's a description of the various That's um, right. tools and um, features on the site. So if you want to try out, start with homework four, but then look at other topics by interest. Mm -hmm. um, the OWL software that <clears throat> this is built on is uh, powerful under the hood and maybe not as pleasingly user facing as it might be. So that's why they're just like homework one, homework two, homework three. But with this key, you can um, get a, a little more guidance into what's actually going on in there. So then do you have students do some of these exercises in class, or are these mainly used on their own time? On their own time. If I taught a smaller class, I would have them do it in class. But also, I can't guarantee that a student necessarily has, has access. access in class, right? Yeah. So then, while you have students in class, are you doing most of the homework then? Yes. And discussion based right. questions? Right. right. And I have small skills. Um, Rules that we do just to make sure that they're going home with enough fluency, mm -hmm. a basic fluency, so that they are not, you know, totally at sea. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, like, what I'll have is six note reading um, uh, notes that they have to read, and uh, if they can do that, then they can do this homework at home. Yeah. And then, do you ever use other tools? I mean, I know there's like, tons of apps now that. Are yeah. Enable students to do all kinds of things. I'm sure there are like lots of music apps. Yes. Or is it primarily what's built into Owl that you have? So the thing about Owl, when they do it on Owl, then I get to see how they're doing. Right. Sure. Um, I give them. There's plenty of. Um, there's plenty of other like. For instance, everything that I teach, there's like 18 YouTube videos about it. Right. And so I will. Um, I didn't get turned off to YouTube videos by students who are like, oh, I missed, I came to class five minutes late, so I went home and I watched this YouTube video, it was great, and I'll, I'll share that with them. And stuff like that. There's a couple of um, um, other websites that do very similar drills that I am giving the viewer of students that they can go and do. Um, do you ever do actual assessments this way? Their homework is assessed this way. So these, this are, these are assessed. homework grades, yes. And so then if they get things wrong, is that so how you there's that, or is it more like do you give them credit for doing this? That's a really good question. So um, over here I've got homework for practice, which was never graded mm -hmm. and is is not timed. So when they do the practice ones. All my all my homeworks do already, right? So I can't see the, the, the things that are graded. Um, if it was, if it was, you know, a couple of weeks ago, they'd see homework for practice, but then they'd also see homework four, and it would have the due date that homework four is, and they have twenty minutes. But when they open it up, it's a timed task, so they have to have enough fluency to be able to do all the questions in twenty minutes. But they can, um, and homework for practice. Uh, gets them to the point that they can then open up homework four and do it for the grade. Have you ever considered using clickers in class in such a large group? Yeah. To make more Absolutely. immediate histograms to show students as a group, okay, we are getting these concepts right here, these I would love to be able to do that. Um, it would be uh, somewhat daunting for me to use get 80 clickers for this particular class, get them an hour from my camp in the class. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the only reason that I'm not here is because I'm really bothered by the um, practicality of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, using like Colonyware and things like that instead of, especially if it's more of an exercise versus something that's for assessment. And you can use your phone to, I mean, I do this even with just training on campus in terms of students. So there are different types of um, Apps that you can use for this. Yeah. Pull in, I think it's pull everywhere. Pull everywhere. And then, then at least, like, 
as you could go on this James approach. Yeah, yeah. I, I could. You'd be able to at least have some sort of like yeah, general yeah, survey yeah, kind of question. Yeah. Or, that's a good idea. And even for questions that are more concept based, you know, some of the ones that are discussion based. Right. We could even, I mean, we'd have to probably be limited to the like multiple choice kind of responses that could generate discussion. That's right. That's right. There's also a, an app that you would have on your phone, and you can distribute cards to students called Clickers. Mm -hmm. And all you do is just go like that, and it records everybody's response, and everybody, you sign up, like, at that time you put, well, this card is, like, number one goes to the student. So you have all the students' data, you know how they did, and it's like five seconds. So just scan everybody in the crowd, you've got all their data, you can quickly see, do, do they get it, do they not get it? Um, and all they do is they just turn a card to ABC or D. Oh, that's neat. That's neat. And it works really well. Clickers, P-L-I-C-K-E-R-S. So then you don't have to worry about that having tech. Yeah. You just bring your phone. Yeah, okay. I mean, then, and then it would project the camera. Yeah. So then you would go to the Clickers website, and as you pull up that, as you bring up that question, and you scan it, it, it actually puts it up there to who's responded, so you know who's responded, or you can go to the results if you just want to show the bar, yeah. you know, see what everybody's saying. Yeah, I like that. Because I do a, you know, a medieval version of that, where, um, <laughs> like, because so many things in music are 1 through 8, right. or 1 through 12. Um, so I can say, uh, what chord is this? And the answer is a five, a five chord. And I say, hold up on your fingers to never look what it is. And so I can like, see that. Right. Right. And often, like, oh, it's two thirds of my class is getting into what one grade isn't. But that's a, a really good way to do a more sophisticated thing that is, is not like fingers. I mean, you, get, you only get four choices in each one, but yeah. it's like, yeah. But you have, but then you have data to take back with you too, and say this is what the students are, yeah. and it's decent, you know, that we're, okay, half the class isn't getting this instantly, let's go back to it. Um, that's good. That's good. So, um, will grades be higher? And then um, musical sophistication, that's what we were grading on. Um, let me talk briefly about grades, and then Luke is going to talk about the, um, the questionnaire. Um, I took the five previous semesters that this course was taught um, is myself and uh, two other teachers. There's three, three total teachers. Um, I, I got, my students had higher grades than average, but they weren't statistically significantly higher. Um, so you can't use that. But, but, but one thing that happened is I didn't get any D's and F's this semester, which is actually kind of extraordinary. Um, this is very statistically significant um, compared to the number of D's and F's in other semesters. And I think that it is because um, I had a lot more drops initially. So if I send if I <coughs> send students to these um, these these drilling tools, I think they are aware that that gives them immediate feedback. They're aware of whether they can uh, this is the sort of thing that they feel like they can do this semester or not, um, and they uh, come to that conclusion earlier than in other semesters. Uh, and then I think the students that stick around have a uh, better, better tools to actually keep them, keep them out of the, the DF zone. Um, okay, you want to talk about great for the yeah. questions? So, um, this should look good. It's on the back of one of the handouts. Um, as Chris was saying, one of the goals for this was to build out space in the course to get at some of these more uh, sophisticated, right, critical historical questions, and so we were sort of kicking around, how are we going to know whether or not that's successful, and so we came up with these very questions. Um, so um, now, I will pass this around. So um, we came up with these as, you know, both good conversation generators and also sort of easy, easy to pick up for students, get them generating um, responses and then build into a discussion, but then we also wanted a more formal way to sort of think about it. Um, as a way of sort of analyzing, you know, what is going on in student responses to this in a way that's very different from sort of reading, right, and looking more at sort of concepts and structure. So we came up with a four-category, three-scoring category rubric, which I will now distribute, um, that we tested this against some sample student answers and had a lot of discussion about what we were 
hoping to see, thinking we might see. Um, we also worked with a team. Um, we have three postdocs working um, on the blended learning initiative with five colleges, so we use them as guinea pigs and also uh, laborers um, for the scoring of the set of responses that we got. Um, so most of these came out of uh, Chris's interest in what he's hoping for the students to sort of build through over the semester, and then I, I think I had a little bit of influence in saying, um, here are some other things to look at. Uh, also building off of a project that I was working on in the previous academic year, um, actually, excuse me, <clears throat> at um, Smith College on a course in um, psych research methods, um, and what this is a sort of similar approach to looking at student responses um, for this sort of concept of acquisition richness, um, and, and that was really just looking at um, final exams to see, you know, did the um, teaching have any effect on them? <laughs> they did. It was, uh, they have not, that was a positive result. Um, so yeah, so this is stuff like this sort of cause and effect structure, right? Are students making an argument? Um, do they see this awareness of um, the cultural situation, situated just of the values of um, any, you know, giving his music, music in a specific culture? Is, is there, are there actually starting to show fluency with technical vocabulary um, rather than just sort of vaguely, you know, pointing at the music or whatnot? And then um, are they showing awareness that like theirs might not be the only view? Um, and so we have sort of, you know, it's really, it's a present absence scale, but then we also wanted some sense of like a really sort of richly present um, in an answer versus maybe just sort of barely present. Um, so, yes, do you want to? Is this work you're sharing with the students? Uh, no, no. Because this is not, um, the assessment isn't graded, right? It's just, it's a conversation generator, and then we're using it to sort of try and see is the instruction, what kind of effect does the instruction have in potentially, because we gave it three posts, and this is the first time we gave it out. So, um, yeah, do you want to, so good to hear we have, we do, we do That's a, a freshman response. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, and this is um, a pretty standard response. Yeah. Music is sound that is constructed by an artist. Mm. <laughs> so, on our rubric, well, is there a cause and effect structure? No. So we can get a zero. Does it show awareness of cultural values or social soldiers? No. Let's get zero technical category. Pretty indicative of today's music that they listen to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly not aware of both of viewpoints. Yeah. Um, so, so a bit. It's edging into a one on the cultural. I don't know. Um, Cultural situation is because at least they, they mention oh, yes. there no, is true. That some is true. sense of a creator and answer. Yeah. You know, uh, that 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 um, it is actually on on our scale a slightly rich answer. But yeah, no technical vocabulary and certainly no awareness. Yeah, I mean one thing that we that we got to for this is for the second um, the awareness of, of cultural situatedness is if they mention the performer of the audience or the surrounding culture. So saying that there is a listener or an, a uh, producer does sort of get at the fact that this is occurring within a particular situation. Yeah. And so we gave them a one for, for that. That puts a one at a really low bar, mm -hmm. which means that most things that we read are going to be here-ish. So what we, we constructed our scale so that we would have a lot of ones, some zeros, some twos. So the purpose was to pull more towards two, uh, pull some of the ones to the twos and the zeros to the ones for, uh, for yeah, there, was, there, was, there was a lot of tuning in um, trying to yeah. sort of calibrate mm -hmm. um, how this assessment, uh, how the rubric was going to land. And um, a lot of, especially around that, came out of actually seeing the student responses and seeing how many of them had just like, Music existing without a listener or a performer or an audience or um, a culture. So, music can communicate emotion by using different uh, something gets cut off here, such as melody, tempo, effects, the reverb to make cut off of subconscious connection with the listener. Um, so, they actually get a high score for technical vocabulary because they point to, they use actually, you know, jargon. Melody, tempo. Um, there's a cause and effect structure here. 
because it is by using something to do something else. So there's a cause and effect structure here. So uh, that's you know not that it's a, a one or a two on the cause and effect structure. It's not going to be a two on the cause and effect structure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, J two. Yeah. So um, what we thought it might be fun. Uh, why don't you take a minute, um, score yourself, um, and get a sense of where you think your your unprompted initial responses were landing um, on our fun and so easy to use <laughs>
So um, this is uh, drawn from another website that does a slightly different thing, but I would like to do something like this. So you're on a C chord. What these little bubbles show you is how likely, in given some corpus of music, some data set of music, how likely you are from a C chord to go to every other chord. And so a student can say, oh, well, I want to go to the most likely thing. I'm going to go to G. Um, or I want to do something surprising, so I'm going to go to D. And then given the choice that they make, okay, I've been on C, now I went to D. What's the likelihood, given those two choices, that I'm going to go back to C, go to E minor, go to A? And so this, this kind of, um, if I could create something like this to help them walk through the decisions that they're making while they're, while they're writing uh, music, I think that would be um, enrich their experience. Sort of uh, put some meat behind the choices that they're making, so it's not just like, oh, I've got some other music report now. Like, it will show what that decision means syntactically. So, yeah.